welcome everyone. Ana Sofia Pelais, Miami Freedom Project, and I'm very excited to be here on what is our last show of season five. We've loved having this time with you all and being able to talk, really talk with the people who are doing, running some amazing programming and campaigns, and really bringing such, um, doing such amazing work in our city. Um, and I can't be happier to finish off our, our first season with the incredible directors, leaders, organizers of Florida Student Power Network. We've um, been very fortunate that we can partner with you at different times and you're always part of our coalition spaces and the work that we're doing. And I, I've always seen the work that you've done with such admiration. I'm so excited to be able to talk to both of you today. So if you could please welcome Paula Munoz, um, Executive Director of Florida Student Power Network and um, Michi Sierd, from, who is the Director of Organizing. So the one who's actually keeping everything moving. Yes. Um, <laughs> So thank you and welcome for welcome to, to the show. Thank you, thank you so much for having us. Likewise, thank you for having us today. Mm -hmm. So can you share with me what, you know, what is the mission of Florida Student Power Network? What is the work that you're trying to do in this space? Well, the main thing about our organization is that we definitely wanna uplift young and directly impacted young people ages 15 to 25 across the state. Um, we currently operate within three main issue programs within our organization, climate justice, education justice, and migrant justice. And the vision of those three programs is that we essentially want young people leading the initiatives, leading the campaigns, leading the strategy relative to the work that we're doing within all of those issues. Um, definitely, we have a lens of uplifting black and brown young people, um, queer folks, um, folks who are working class, um, and that's the lens that we bring to the organization. Um, really want to center in on our organization being very youth-led, um, because that's so um, important to our organization. For example, myself, I joined the organization when I was a sophomore um, in, in college, and I think that speaks to the leadership development, as well as the organizing that we're trying to teach our young people to interact with. Um, and our goal is that um, the youth movement in Florida continues to expand and is essentially youth-led, right? And allows young people to organize and develop the skills to effectively organize. Amazing, and can you share, um, Paula, how long have you been with the organization? So uh, with the organization, um, so I started also as a youth organizer uh, when I was 19 years old, uh, and I started through the immigrant rights movement, so students working for equal rights. Um, so I actually found Student Power in 2017, uh, like I found the organization um, and they needed an immigrant justice organizer. So I was between two organizations, Flick and Student Power, to essentially build the immigrant rights um, statewide movement again. It had been a little bit dormant from so many things, from exhaustion to just demoralization, so many things, right? Uh, where a lot of immigrant youth were not getting centered anymore, right? After the deferred action had passed. Um, and so, uh, from that, uh, I was actually their first immigrant rights organizer. Uh, then I went over to work at Flick um, and worked in many different roles through Flick. And then um, I just started actually a role here with Student Power as the executive director. So it's very full circle. So definitely echo what Mishi says around it being a political home and uh, actual pipeline that represents building up youth leadership from when they're younger to be able to lead in these spaces and strategize. I, I think it's so interesting that you both identified as having begun as students and then in your early career have stayed within the organization. Can you describe for me a little bit about what that experience is like? As students, what was your own experience of wanting to engage in this in a very meaningful way? What, what brought you both to decide from the beginning before you were actually leading the organization that as students you wanted to take part in this way? I can definitely speak to that. Um, I shared that I joined the organization as a sophomore in college. And beforehand, I was kind of like learning within the, 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 the youth movement. Um, I wanted to step in, but I, I didn't know exactly how to tap in. And I was kind of just interacting with the organization because I wanted the knowledge and kind of like to just be in the space and learn. Um, and that happened right in 2018. Um, I'm Haitian, um, so I grew up in a family that was very anti-politics, right, given what's currently happening in Haiti and what happened during my childhood in terms of like how to engage with politics and what normally happens when it comes to politics, right? But I guess my experience as um, a high school student 
and a freshman in college, I was like, okay, the life that we're currently living, the life that our community isn't living just isn't right, right? And I wanna be able to change that. And that's how I entered into the space. Um, I connected with an organizer at the time who was organizing students at Miami Dade College because I was a Miami Dade College student. Um, a little bit hesitant to interact with them and the organization, but I just kind of fell in. And the organization definitely gave me the skills to understand organizing. At the beginning, I thought what I was doing was just change making and learning about like how I can make folks' lives better. But through that, through the organization, I was able to gain the political analysis, gain the leadership skills, um, gain the training in order to understand organizing and understand what it takes to effectively organize. And the way that they did that was that they extended fellowships um, and opportunities to engage around certain campaigns that d definitely fed me and allowed me to connect with other organizers within the space um, that I looked up to and wanted to do a lot of the similar do a lot of similar work um, as many of them were doing. And so through the the fellowships, through the membership, through the campaigns, and all the tactics associated with the work that we were doing, I was able to gain the training and end up leading a lot of the initiatives that were, were within the organization to where I can currently be where I'm at today, um, the director of organizing at Florida Student Power. Amazing, and what is different for you, just thinking it through as a student, because I do feel that because of social media, it's, it, I wouldn't even say it's, it's a very low barrier to engage. We can all feel like, we can all feel like activists and organizers from, from our phones. But you're talking about a different degree of commitment, a different degree mm -hmm. of understanding, a different degree of education. What is that step up for you if you're a student who's just, you know, expressing themselves? I feel like it's almost like you have that immediate cathartic experience that you need, but then it's also can stay with you. It can, it can kind of, it can mean a lot, but then it can mean very little because we're all constantly liking or disliking. Or like, mm -hmm. we're all engaging, we're all organizing ourselves and through social media, but then that's not necessarily gonna lead to an organized lasting change or an organized campaign where you're right. organizing your community to make an impact or make a change. So what is the difference for you with, with Florida Student Power Network? How does Florida Student Power direct that energy to real systemic change? And I'll, I'll start, Pau, and then I'll pass yeah, it to no, you. <laughs> um, I think for me that change was definitely becoming a member, right, of Florida Student Power and deciding to join a movement organizing organization. Um, like you said, on social media, it's so easy for folks to take a stance. It's so easy for folks to learn and gain knowledge, but you really need a space to kind of funnel energy through and accept a role in our movement. And that was the change for me. In 2018, I decided to join the organization and accept a role and add my piece to the movement, which then allowed me to continue my journey um, in organizing and make the connections and connect with other po folks within our movement, right, to kind of support the campaigns and lead the campaigns that we were doing. So that change, and you know, for any young, young person that's listening, it's what are you deciding to be your political home, right? Who are, who's feeding you? Who are you connected with, right, that's going to support you along your organizing journey? Because you can't do it behind the screen. Movements weren't created um, behind the screen, right? Um, that could be the way that you first get connected or first get activated, but you really need to act, and you can act through joining a movement organizing organization. Wonderful. So as students who have stayed in the space and developed through it in your professional capacities and what you're, what the work that you're aspiring to do, what is it like from an organization perspective when you have, you're working with a population that's in some way transitory? They're, they're, they're mm -hmm. very engaged when they're, when they're students. I would ask you two questions. What makes this kind of work possible when you're a student? And what do you see when people start leaving, when they're leaving school, post high school, post college? Postgrad school, where they're where they're less when they're less engaged. What is that transition point for you? How do you keep people engaged? So, I can start and then <laughs> pass over. So, I think the way that it like where it makes a difference, right, is just having like a deep analysis of like the change that we're trying to make and understanding that it's there's different roles to different movement spaces, right? And so, for example, there's a lot of student yes, uh, student led movements that are led by students, but there's an ecosystem of support in different types of way, right? There's res uh, resources, there's intergenerational wisdom that also is passed down to be supportive. And so that 
it's kind of like a lot of the times it kind of seems like when folks see student movement building, it's kind of like, oh, they're doing it on their own. And, and, and it's, it's a lot of the times also with our students, they're like, you know, we feel, it feels the pressure. So understanding that there's a network of support that allows them to lead without being paternal, right? Like mm -hmm. without making the decisions, but actually just activating them to resources that they have and they can access, I think be, builds not only a deeper connection of experience, but also makes a, like, kind of like opens up the mind to like folks that may be not aware, like there is a bigger network out here. There's a bigger, it's bigger than just like, just in a, in a specific college or from like a specific sp standpoint because you're like, you know, in a club or no, like when you actually open up students into the movement, which is what Mishi was mentioning, that is our method in how we organize. We, you know, we wanna make sure that they're part of the table of, partners that we're with, that they're able to be part of the coalitions, that they're actually representative of our organization as students in these coalition spaces, right? Like, I think that's how folks become more invested because you're investing in them. And then mm -hmm. they see themselves not as like, okay, I'm just doing this for hours or I'm doing this because I'm a president of my club and then I'm gonna, you know, peace out. <laughs> it, they see themselves in a way that it's deeper or at least that's that's how I've, I've I experienced it myself and also like, with the trajectory of other youth that you know I've I've had the honor to like mentor, I think that's what makes the difference is when they see the bigger picture that mm -hmm. they see the systems that are also not just impacting students that it's actually like a whole inter system that's working to oppress folks beyond their status as students right like it's attacking immigrants their mm -hmm. systems that are impacting so many different ways and also like how they connect the systems they're fighting in their campuses to like the outside, right? Like it's not just coming from the campuses, it's coming from the government, it's coming from so many different entities. And I think that political education and resource is so important for them to be able to feel connected deeper than just, as like you mentioned, like a transition, mm -hmm. right? Like saying there's room for you in the movement even after you leave because mm -hmm. this is bigger than mm -hmm. this, right? And what, how did, Flor what, what, what makes Florida Student Power Network different from what this would look like in another state. How do you feel that Florida Student Power Network is different or is an expression of who's in Florida and what people care about in Florida? I, I definitely, I think what's coming to mind for me are two things, right? Definitely want to double tap on what Paula said around like our movement ecosystem. Um, we're very deeply connected with organizations across the state who are moving the work for everyday Floridians. And I think I'm very proud of that, and I'm happy that we get to connect our young people to those different spaces because they get to participate within our collective struggle and our collective movement that is currently happening within this state when so much is stacked up against us, and folks across this country can see that. Um, and so that's definitely you know, something that we offer um, to folks who join our organization, just participating in our ecosystem and being a part of that collective movement. I think um, another thing that differentiates us or aligns us with different um, youth organizations within, um, within this country, right, is the fact that we allow folks to learn through us and tap in at every different level. I'm reflecting on my experience um, when I first joined Florida Student Power. Um, this space could have definitely been very intimidating for me, right, because there were so many folks who had different levels of knowledge within the space, but I can never remember a time when I felt different mm -hmm. and I was always welcomed. And so this space allows folks at whatever what level you are within your organizing journey, within your political analysis, to tap in. And mm -hmm. I think that's something beautiful and wonderful when we're in a country where definitely cancel culture can allow you to not interact within different spaces. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that, right, like the way folks think, um, can be a challenge, right? But I do think we allow folks to grow and we allow mm -hmm. folks to challenge their thinking in a way that sharpens their political analysis and differentiates us from other spaces within, within the, the, the state as well as the country, right? Where we know there's so much knowledge on social media to where folks probably when they interact with the organization, they are already politicized in a way. Mm -hmm. But what about the young people who didn't have an opportunity to be politicized, right? And are still learning their political Mm -hmm. um, ethos or, or are sharpening their political analysis. What about them? Well, we offer that to them to engage with the fundamentals to where we can um, 
move them through, throughout our space and allow them to see themselves within the youth movement. Yeah. And, and I would say like, for example, even um, like definitely like plus to everything Mishi said, um, which was great. I think also thinking about it like, right, like being rooted in that transformative justice, right, understanding that not, no one was born with quote unquote woke, right? Like nobody, like mm -hmm. everyone has different traumas, right? Like I know many immigrants that are anti-immigrant and mm -hmm. like that they deal with a lot of things through their trauma and it's like, we need to meet folks where they're at um, and try to see like where we can find common ground and that unless it's someone negating the existence of another person, then there's always like a way to be able to like politicize or like mm -hmm. help folks like figure out by giving them information, exposing them to different things, right? Obviously security culture is very important to us as well, mm -hmm. right? So we wanna make sure that we're mitigating harm, like, you know, making sure that harm is contained mm -hmm. and that if things need to be addressed, um, they need to be addressed. But I would just say that I think uh, one of the things that really we wanna think about when we're, um, you know, just even like engaging with youth is that right now, the online to offline is something that is very, very, it's a challenge for us, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of also young people started their journeys through a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so even, even through those moments, it's that really slow intentional kind of pace that we need to like focus in and intentionality around how to politicize folks during a post pandemic world. We can't go back yeah. to tactics from 2019. Uh, we have to transform to different you know, ways to do that. No, I think it's so powerful what you're both describing because I do think, look, as an organization, I think we all struggle with, you know, I, th I think you can feel very energized by somebody that's being called out, but at the same time, you also feel like it can happen to anyone. Like it, it right. can become very, it can feel very arbitrary. And I, I love what you're describing because it's, uh, it's describing safety through understanding mm -hmm. as opposed to something that can be seen as very dogmatic or somebody be trying to be caught out for something that they legitimately haven't encountered before. Right. And I think that, you know, what you're describing can lead to a more, a deeper change. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's wonderful. And I think it speaks to being engaged with students who are open. So you have to take that responsibility of how they're being introduced to things, how they're understanding, what, what, what resources and education you're bringing to them, mm -hmm. um, which I think yeah. is what makes your work so powerful. Um, something I love that you said is when you started the sentence with, I'm Haitian, so describing your political imperative, I thought that can go either way. It can either be like, I'm going to be so political because of this experience, or my family just wants, wanted nothing to do with it, which I think both of those experiences in South Florida, we understand mm -hmm. having so many of us having come from situations that were untenable because of politics or feeling mm -hmm. that po the political situation just changed your, your ability to live in the culture you love, speak the language that you love, have your friendships and your neighbors. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think it, 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 it pushes you in one w direction or the other, but it's never, it's never a, a, safe, a middle, it's never a middle road, it's an extreme. Mm -hmm. So I think having Florida Student Power Network, that has to be so much a part of the experience of it's gonna define you in a way that without people, other organizers also having that experience, you just get lost. I don't know, I didn't, you know, I went to school in New York City in a way that was much more, in a much more political environment, but I don't think I was politically, as politically engaged as I am here now, mm. because that understanding wasn't part of that mm -hmm. engagement. So I, I really appreciate that, you know, if I had a Florida Student Power Network, <laughs> I think I probably would have started much sooner. Um, can you tell me a little bit, what campaigns have you done in the recent, like recently, in the last year, I would say that you feel were, were most, you, you felt really good about, that you felt like everything that was working was working the way that you would hope it would and the way that you were bringing people into the space was, was effective? Um, I can definitely uplift um, the work that we've done within our education justice program. Um, and as many of the viewers um, might already know or may not know, right, like we live in a space that's currently, we live in a state that's currently attacking education. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of students feel that, a lot of students know that. Um, and what we've been able to do successfully through our education justice program is educate folks around the current attacks and then kind of funnel that energy into um, student formations um, that are currently happening ac across the state. Um, and, and one thing I can uplift around the work that we did around our education justice program 
are definitely what in the Florida town halls that we were able to do <laughs> um, to educate community about what's currently happening in the state and the impacts of legislative session when it comes to education. Um, when, we, when we think about HB1, um, HB, um, SB 266, right, um, that has kind of like hit our state, right, within the last um, two to three years, um, a lot of folks, right, didn't know where to start or didn't understand what was happening. But I think in Miami specifically, the way that we brought um, community in around understanding the attacks and partnering with some awesome folks um, to kind of bring that um, education to folks was very powerful. And now, um, and that was actually the program where a lot of our young people um, began tapping in when we began um, talking about, right, what the impacts of legislative session would have within our state. I think currently now within our movement, we're definitely um, taking a local approach because of the impacts, right, that we've experienced through our past legislation by going to our school boards. And we're right now um, in the space of kind of like educating folks and also trying to bring folks in around like what that power and what that analysis can look like, right, within the next few years, but definitely education justice in terms of um, exposing impacts of HB7 and SB266 through community listening sessions, um, through um, community activations with our organizers has been um, very powerful and kind of been like um, one of the major things that we've done within the past two years. Yeah, and I mean, I witnessed the organization mm -hmm. from uh, when I was at Flick, right? I was the organizing director at Flick previous to this uh, position and role in one of the things that I was extremely proud with Student Power is um, the different campaigns that they created around community protection, right? Mm -hmm. After the previous anti-immigrant bill that came out, SB 1718, and so many attacks, right? Like, I feel like the past three legislative sessions have just been like extra, you know, geared um, to divide us because they're attacking everyone at once, right? Like, um, in fact, like, you know, DeSantis has made it very clear to say, these are my priorities before mm -hmm. to kind of like, set us all into emergency mode. And one mm -hmm. of the things that after this legislation and so many different things kind of came out around like, you know, abortion bans, um, you know, uh, the anti-immigrant bills, the attack on LGBTQ communities, um, Student Power actually launched um, a campaign called We Keep Us Safe. And it was such to me the narrative around that transformative, um, like that transformative imagination and radical imagination of like, in a moment where everyone was panicking to see like, no, we, we got each other, right? Like we love each other. To me, that was extremely touching as like a partner of Student Power and because uh, in, you know, we're part of uh, the membership of, Stu of Florida Immigrant Coalition. So like with that campaign, it kind of encompassed like deep listening sessions. It encompassed door knocking. Um, most in, locally in Miami, we partnered up together uh, really deeply with the students at the time um, to start holding accountability around the representatives like Eliana Garcia, Representative Eliana Garcia, that was saying some horrible anti-immigrant things and horrible things about our communities. And we held a lot of accountability up to the point that her Twitter got shut down at one point because like, you know, like the media was also like saying, hey, like you said you didn't support this bill, but clearly your voting says otherwise. And so having students be able to be there, we had our organ, like, um, Student Powers organizer, uh, Lady Amador, who is a Cuban immigrant, speak about the rhetoric that Eliana was trying to pose around the Cuban community against immigrants. As an immigrant, she stood proudly in a press conference just saying, this is not the rhetoric that, like, I want my community, like, don't, don't speak for me in this because we are not part of that. And so, like, seeing that, like, youth being involved in a moment of community care and, like, rapid response, um, was just so powerful and so beautiful and um, how it's expanded into like, for example, disaster resiliency. We work a lot with the COC with Smile Trust um, and that's part of like that We Keep a Safe campaign. So it's like the community protection arm and just seeing students be involved in these spaces is to me like, I, I don't know, to me like that was one of the most, um, like, I don't know, like I felt awe seeing y'all build those, those structures up. I mean, I think you, you all did incredible work during that time. And I think what's so powerful about what you've just shared in that experience was 
it, it's almost confirming a narrative. It's almost like you can feel like you're being hypnotized. It's like, I'm not anti-immigrant, but I'm going to vote for this. Mm -hmm. um, this is what this community wants, because I'm, I'm representing and I'm speaking to that. And it takes somebody to say, I'm part of this community and this mm -hmm. doesn't represent me. And I think that's a real power that Florida Student Power Network has, because you do have the capacity to reset a narrative, mm -hmm. because you're not, you're, 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 it's a community that's, they're new voters. They're new, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're new to, us, to, to the spaces in every way that there's nobody that can say who they are or what they're, how they're gonna fall in line or how they're gonna, you know, how they're gonna vote, what they're gonna feel about it, and it can change. And I think that's what's been so exciting about having a youth-led movement. Everything's off the table. Mm -hmm. It's all new, <laughs> everything's being questioned. And that can be very difficult, mm -hmm. but I think there's the, all the opportunities are in those questions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's wonderful that, and that from that student perspective that you're, that you're bringing it to that, what campaigns are you developing looking to the future that you think are going to be where your membership, and can I ask you, is mm -hmm. your membership directing which issues that you take on? How are you in conversation with your members and with the people who are participating in the Florida Student Power Network? So it's twofold, right? Um, we do a lot, we do take on a lot of the work that our members um, bring to us, but we're also, like we shared before, in deep connection, right, and solidarity with like our movement partners, right? to where we understand that we, we, we do have to push for certain initiatives, right, because our communities needs, need it. And I think an example of that is our current work within our migrant justice program. We're currently pushing for temporary protected status for Haitians and, and Nicaraguans because we understand um, the support and um, the impact that it's going to have for Nicaraguan as well as Haitian communities um, within the migrant justice space, for example, humanitarian parole has allowed uh, more than 138,000 Haitian migrants, right, um, to enter into the United States. Um, for Nicaragua, um, they haven't been able to have temporary protected status since 1999, if I'm not mistaken, right, which means that currently about around 500,000 um, Nicaraguan migrants um, do, are undocumented, right, because they're, they're unable um, to be protected under um, temporary protected status. And so currently, we're currently partnering um, with the Florida Immigrant Coalition, who I do sit on the board for as well, um, to ensure that we're pushing for temporary protected status for Haitians and Nicaraguans, because we know that um, currently this is an election year, right? We don't know what's going to happen in November. We're fighting to ensure that um, we do um, elect um, someone who can allow us to continue with the current protections for those communities, right? But we're planning ahead because we do know that if we don't secure it um, within the next two to three months that a lot of folks probably may be undocumented mm -hmm. depending on what may happen um, in November. So that's currently a huge um, portion of the work that we're currently leading within the Migrant Justice Program. Um, a second um, program um, campaign that we're currently leading around um, within our Migrant Justice Program um, is a lot of our students, a lot of our um, members have been coming to the organization and ensuring that um, we support um, um, divesting from Israel, right, with what's currently happening um, in, ha in Palestine around the genocide that Israel is currently doing against Palestinian people. Um, our members and young people across the state deeply care about that, right? And we wanna make sure that we're uplifting the work that we're doing and also shouting them out, shouting out all the organizers who are pushing against, pushing for divestment from Israel across um, different colleges and universities across the state. And that's currently some work that um, our, palace, our organizer who is Palestinian is leading in ensuring that um, they uplift the voices of young people within that state. And we're deeply rooted with other organizations, Palestinian-led organizations who are also leading that work and Palestinian organizers who are doing that work as well. Yeah. As organizers, as youth organizers, how do you see, not to put you on the spot for a story that's mm -hmm. developing and changing yeah. um, every day, but we have all been watching this for the last two mm -hmm. weeks. Um, you know, I went to this, the very political school that I went to was Barnard. And mm -hmm. when I saw those, those things break out in Columbia and Barnard, I thought, I mean, this is just, this is who they are. Like, this is who's drawn to go to that school. This is who wants to mm -hmm. study in that environment. So to see them, you know, I think Edward Said was a hero. Like, I think if you were, at, you know, at, at school at that time when he was still teaching, that was the class that you wanted to get into, that was the experience that you wanted to have. So to have that information, to have that academic mm -hmm. rigor applied to the situation, to have it applied in this capacity and then see it 
this contradiction for how the administration yeah. was seeing, seeing it through um, has been interesting for me personally. How do you see it as or from campus organizing perspective? Mm -hmm. How the encampments came about and what you, what you would want that communication with the administration to be if it's going to be productive and mm -hmm. it's going to address a real need and real understanding of a, of a very terrible, there aren't any words for what we're seeing yeah. every day. Yeah, it's, I think, I think really the root of it, and I think I want to make sure, like, you know, like, folks listening and, like, also see, like, we're 100% we're in support of the students on campus that are taking actions, right? Like, it's, it's something that is very integral to our organization that um, student-led movements need to have autonomy, right? So, like, for us, it's not like we were, like, okay, we're gonna, you guys have to do it this way. No, like the way that we've been approaching this, especially particularly as it's starting to now engulf Florida, right? Like I think it was a little bit slow to start in Florida because we have a fascist government <laughs> or like governor, right? And he is, uh, has put really horrible laws uh, in place in case, you know, protesters we saw after BLM, the response to that was HB1, right? We've seen uh, something that actually was successful on our end that um, one of the, um, education censorship freedom speech bills that they wanted to pass that basically put students protesting for you know divestment or ceasefire we're going to be seen as terrorist organizations like mm -hmm. things like that that actually didn't pass um it may i think it it's definitely created kind of like how do we even do this without feeling like the the gauntlet drop mm -hmm. so harshly on our students or even them themselves right like having that fear and i think it's just been so exciting to see like them being courageously like you know there is no graduation for me right now when I see that like like schools are getting destroyed when there's people that are like not getting graduate like there's students right now that are literally making the choice to get banned from the universities if it means actually like making noise about something that like right now it should be like enraging everybody right mm -hmm. and and I think for the for for us what we're seeing around like the universities right is that the universities have definitely doubled down around um, again the punishment we've seen students getting completely like banned from their campuses we've dealt with students international students that are now like facing chart like you know banning and it's like does that mean I'm gonna get now now you know deported back to my country because mm -hmm. now I can't study because my visa is violating like me being banned from campus is violating my visa right like things like that that I'm just like it really shows the priority of um of the universities in a moment also that the Santi appointees are part of these boards mm -hmm. and are part like it's all interconnected and I think that that's something that we want to make the connections with because it's not it's not something that is like that in Florida we can take lightly, right? Like mm -hmm. that it's, this is very systemically like put so that folks are not able to protest on campuses, are not able to, which mo all the protests have been very peaceful in Florida. Like mm -hmm. I was so enraged to see that they were throwing gas canisters at these students that literally were peacefully sitting in a lawn. Like to me that was, again, it just speaks to the moment of Florida and also the Santis came out with an announcement two days prior, right? Like saying, we need to use maximum force. We need mm -hmm. like universities, make sure that you're punishing your students. Hearing that from a lead, like that is not normal, right? And like, it is a nationwide type of thing, but I just wanna make sure that we're also focused on Florida on how it's, mm -hmm. how it's being like puppeteered, right? And so the way that we're seeing it is this, is, is that we believe that the administrations, um, they are tied to a, a personal agenda. And so for us, the biggest thing is to make sure that students are um, you know, building campaigns that are meeting different demands, that they're strategically th thinking about these things, that they're researching like the ties of the monies. And I think that they're really doing that. I think UF was the first um, in camp and, and they, their demands were like beautiful. Like they came out very like clear, very strong, saying like, you know, we don't, right now we're getting barrier of seeing where you're getting money from. So we need that transparency, right? Like, so like, just kind of like making sure that folks are following like kind of like stra strategy and like campaign building, I think, do I see our state moving forward or like even our campus is moving towards investment? I'm not, I'm not too sure because I feel like, like I mentioned, right? It's very puppeteered mm -hmm. um, to be against us, but I do see that it's creating questions 
around people's morales. Like it's moving towards people's morale. Like what, what, it, what are we protecting if we're criminalizing our students on campuses for saying and speaking out about what they believe in, right? Like when there's a genocide and there's like deaths happening across the world and for students, it makes sense for students to care about these things. It makes sense for the world to care about these things. And so um, I think that that's, that's part of the way that like we wanna make sure that that consciousness is protected and it's uplifted because they're not doing anything wrong by pushing for their, for, for uh, a ceasefire, for pushing for humanity, right? Like it's like a human, like, yeah, it's just like a human ask that they're, they're really behind and it's humanity that they're behind. And so it's just, yeah, it's just really, I think if anything is just making consciousness mm -hmm. like spread, like why are these kids getting arrested? Why are they getting banned from their campuses? Why are they getting criminalized, right? Like, um, and I think that that's more for us to like really work around to mm -hmm. make sure that they're protected. But, um, but we're still gonna push, like regardless of like the odds against us, um, we're still gonna support students and ho support them in their campaigns. And you know, who knows, maybe like administrations will start moving towards where they need to, but yeah. so far they've been pretty ruthless. Yeah, no, and I, I do think to what you're describing, and it's something I think we talk about in Florida so often, um, in the last few years, it's always the chilling effect. Mm -hmm. It's what is actually, what laws are in the books? What has actually passed? Mm -hmm. That's made, you know, organizing, exercise of speech, engagement, conversation, that we all need to have. This is something worth having. If there's something worth going to war over, it's there's something worth discussing. Mm -hmm. That's just, yeah. You, it should never not. It should never be, be above reproach. It should never be above discussion. It should never be above a very rigorous understanding of reasons for against movement. It, it all has to. It all has to be part mm -hmm. of exercise of democracy and speech and constant right. engagement. Yeah. And that's something that I think should be part of the educational process. But in Florida, we don't know. We don't know what the laws are. We don't know. We know what the laws are. But we don't know exactly how they would be implemented. So I think it's something so that could be, you know, we would think of a standard exercise mm -hmm. of free speech in another state could be used against student protesters in a way that, you know, we're not going to necessarily see the engagement we're seeing in other states. Right. Um, and right. this is, I think, the first big test of that, how people can engage on this issue given what laws are in mm -hmm. place. Um, and I, you know, I think it's again so important to to the work that you're doing. How do you feel that Florida is directing students are directed towards a different, you know, a different engagement? Because I think I would think migrant rights are not going to be as relevant in other states as they are in Florida. It's a very lived experience here mm -hmm. in Florida. How do you feel that that kind of directs the energy to what your continuous programming is? And you know, mm -hmm. I think um, our migrant justice program is once again something that differentiates our organization from a lot of organizations across the country, right, across the state, because we do con we do develop that, we have this container and this space for immigrant youth, right, and folks who support immigrant youth and immigrant justice to interact and support and lead very impactful um, campaigns. Um, and I think, like we, we shared before, another reason for that is because of the movement ecosystem in which we exist in, we understand that it's so important, um, even though we do know the immigrant justice movement, the immigrant justice youth movement is severely underfunded, that we create that space, we cultivate it, and we allow it to exist mm -hmm. and continue despite the odds that we currently have. Um, I think as we're tie tying the genocide currently happening um, in Palestine to migrant justice, right? That was a decision that we made as an organization because we deeply understood that immigrant justice is directly tied to the genocides that are currently happening in the world, right? What's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Sudan, mm -hmm. what's happening in Congo, what's happening in Haiti, all of it is interconnected when we look at the roots of migration. And when we think of Florida, mm -hmm. right, which has um, the High, one of the states that has the highest amount of um, immigrants in this country, right? We know that we couldn't be an organization or we couldn't have been doing, um, doing our due diligence to the youth movement without cultivating that space and allowing it to exist. And I think um, that is, that, that's, that's really powerful. In terms of what we have to fight, right? 
um, SB 17, 16, 17, 17, 18. 17, 18. SB 17, mm -hmm. 18, um, I think panicked and like, was very, it was, was a very divisive bill, right? Because it was attacking so many different groups of different groups, right? Within one package, right? But I think as we kind of fought against that and saw um, how our communities were responding to that, we came out of it stronger and aligned, I think, within the immigrant rights movement. And when it comes to um, immigrant youth, creating containers where they can directly tap in and see where they have a role and also defining what our role what our roles are within the space right so how are we addressing um, international affairs how are we actively working towards a pathway to citizenship for migrant youths in directly impacted communities how are we providing college resources um, to students right who are migrant youth who may be undocumented or who may not have the access to receive funding for their education, right? I think we're like the, the, the buckets that we identified that impacts migrant young people. And when young people see that, they come to us, right, to move within that space and they create greater alignment and can tap into that movement ecosystem that we're a part of. How many students in your network do you feel are directly impacted by, mm. and I, I mean, <laughs> direct, yeah. like they're potentially directly impacted by the issues that you're you're working on. I mean they're all in the education justice they're all students. Yes. <laughs> yes. That one's easy. But I mean how I, I mean how many are yeah. coming from a first generation immigrant experience or having mm -hmm. or in a mixed status family or their own statuses? So I would say well we have um, we had this which actually I came from this network like Florida Immigrant Youth Network, right? That um, kind of like Florida Student Power started supporting and so we have a network there of um, a lot of documented students but now we're getting the waves of undocumented students and so we have um, you know different folks across right um, uh, across the state that have come to us around questions around immigration support or even when we're working with the immigrant coalition the Florida immigrant coalition like you know we're deferred and so I would say like in our network there's a lot of folks that have mixed status, I would say at least, uh, whether it's DACA, TPS, undocumented, right? Like we have a lot of non-citizen students that are very passionate um, around supporting like, you know, the immigrant narrative or children of immigrants that are, mm -hmm. uh, but for directly impacted, I would say we have, we have quite a bit, uh, particularly in South Florida mm -hmm. um, and, and Orlando as well. Um, and then when it comes to climate justice, um, the way that our framework works is that it's, tied to the communities uh, like that get impacted by climate change, right? So it's a lot of folks that get impacted during the hurricanes, for example, low-income communities, um, a, you know, folks that are dealing with issues around uh, proper protections for housing. So like a lot of our climate work is around disaster resiliency when it comes to, to climate because a lot of our students are impacted by those things when disasters are happening in Florida. So I would say that um, that's the reason kind of like why we like have shaped their campaigns in the way that they were, right? Like, so it's like, it's not general climate, it's specifically we do disaster resiliency, we do support with energy work because that's tied to, to our students in, in Tampa, for example. Uh, for immigrant rights, um, right now there's, I think statistically, I think it's 300,000 plus students across the nation right now, like, and you know that those numbers mm -hmm. are hard to always get um, perfect, but, um, that right now are experiencing graduating high school without a license, uh, for example, because there's no more DACA, right? Like, the production is not a thing for youth anymore. It's mm -hmm. now, a lot of those youth are now adults or older. Yeah. And so <laughs> that, that, for example, us going back into those things that we're like, okay, now we have to start doing, again, like, in-state tuition um, conversations, right, trainings, uh, we need to start like supporting folks like around them being dri like driving without licenses, them having all these risks that, you know, at the time before DACA, there was a lot of support and noise around, right? Like if someone was undocumented and was a young person, they had a movement like immig like undocumented, not afraid movement to go into. Right now there's been a lull. Um, and so like it's up to organizations, not only like student power, but like, you know, other immigrant-centered organizations to think about the youth, right? Like the, the new youth that are coming in. Oh, sorry. And that, um, 
And those are things like I, I feel like in the ecosystem we we're really thinking about bringing in, right? Like bringing up that fact um, because it does come from our students also being part of that 300,000, right? Like that are now like, you know, now we're, we're figuring out parameters on how to like, how to have meetings where we're not exposing folks to driving or like, you know, things like that, so. Um, no, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, I do want to make sure we get to our Miami questions yes. because you're doing amazing <laughs> work in Florida, but I also think you're part of our Miami mm. world and I wanna get your, your take. So we have these questions that we do, that we ask everyone. There's no right or wrong answer, but it's just <laughs> your own lived experience of being in Miami. Um, what is Miami doing right? We like to start positive. I know that we, we all in the work of trying to make things better, but what is Miami doing right, right now? Yes, this, 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 is a, this is a very <laughs> difficult like you, question. You've lived longer in Miami. Yes, <laughs> very difficult question. I think um, the election of um, our current mayor, right, um, was definitely a win. <laughs> um, Daniela Levin Cava, that um, has been great for Miami, and we really do have to do the job of ensuring that we're able to continue having that, right, um, with this upcoming election that we have. And in the general sense, what Miami is doing right is ensuring that we uplift the different cultures that we have. I think everyone knows that Miami is a culture hub um, filled with so many different people, so many different countries, um, so many different types of folks. And I think that is like one of the things that makes Miami distinct and different, the, the, the different communities um, that we have. And so I'd say in terms of the political sense, right, like our mayor, that's something that we did right. <laughs> and like in the broader sense, um, definitely the communities um, that we have is, is, is something that makes Miami Miami and is a beautiful part of us. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I mean, I, does it have to be political or it could be like anything? No, it could just be. I, <laughs> so I, I, I just moved to North Miami three years mm -hmm. ago. So um, I used to live in Broward and organize more in Broward, but all my youth organizing was in Miami basically. Uh, and uh, I would say the food, mm -hmm. right? I think they're doing right at the food and the fact that there you could find food anywhere at like 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. Or like mm -hmm. uh, I've been traveling a lot and I've been getting that culture shock over there where it's like I might plane arrives late and then there's no nothing food. open. Yeah. So. Okay. Good. No, <laughs> it's good. We have to love where we're, where we're at. Yeah. Um, what is Miami doing wrong? <sighs> and I think there's so many things we can we can say around this. Mm -hmm. I think for me, being someone who is of Haitian descent, who is a Haitian migrant, gentrification is something that makes my heart very heavy living um, in the city of Miami. Uh, my grandmother, before she passed away, um, owned a business in Little Haiti. Um, and my mother is continuing that legacy right now in Little Haiti as a small business owner. Um, in the, in the neighborhood. Um, a few years ago, what I currently see of Little Haiti and like what it is currently mm -hmm. now definitely makes my heart heavy and sad because I see it, I see gentrification. I see people leaving um, happening every day and before my eyes to where I think within the next few years, I won't be able to recognize Little Haiti the way that I used to know it when I first arrived in this country back in 2013. Uh, another thing that really makes my heart heavy in Miami is the housing crisis. I think you can't talk about Miami's problems without talking about housing, without talking about affordable housing, and without talking about how folks are getting pushed out of um, what they know is home. Um, and that also makes my heart heavy, and uh, me also being directly impacted <laughs> in yeah. that sense, right, when it comes to housing, I think everyone is directly impacted right now. Like if you have been a Miami nati native, like over um, a certain experience of time. But I really think that we need to do something to address housing mm -hmm. um, and not even like housing when it comes to affordable housing, but also living conditions. Um, we have a lot of property develop developers and folks who are managing um, housing access right in the city who permit um, unlivable conditions for folks. And because we do have um, a lot of migrant folks who live in this city, they don't necessarily know how to fight back against their slumlords or against properties that are unlivable, but yet they're having to bear 
um, with it because they don't have anywhere to go or they can't afford to go anywhere else. Um, so that mm -hmm. is definitely something that Miami is doing wrong. Um, what is your most nostalgic Miami memory? Oh, um, for me, I think when I first got here, um, you know, I came from Colombia and um, I, I, I came from Colombia when I was very young. I was separated from, with my, from my mom for a year and a half and something that my aunt would do when we were younger was uh, to cheer us up because, you know, we were, me and my sister were experiencing a lot of um, the stress of being separated from our parents and my aunt was our, our guardian here and so she would take us to Bayside Mm -hmm. um, and we would go on the little boats, those little Star Island boats. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, to me, every time I like, I'm near Bayside, like whether, now I do it for like activism, like I'll be like flyering mm -hmm. <laughs> about Tor like- Torture friendship. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but every time I walk by, it just brings that like solace, like it brought a little bit of joy in a moment where I was very confused and scared and, and little. And like, it just brings me back to like that moment with my aunt, oh, yeah. Lovely. What do you miss that Miami used to have? Hmm. And I think you've touched upon this already that you know used to be in Little Haiti and you felt like you were in Little Haiti. You felt like you were in a different part of Miami and it was wonderful. And, and elements of that still exist, right? Like, you know, I currently live in Liberty City, which isn't too far away from Little Haiti. Um, but I think um, just the ability um, to just stroll the streets and just see culture, and you still get that, However, I think the gentrification that's currently happening has definitely um, like stalled that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Whereas like I can walk down one street and like feel a sense of community and then on the other street it's like, a, you know, a party town for tourists. <laughs> um, which isn't exactly wrong, but of course like it's pushing, it's pushing folks out. Um, me being on the younger end, um, a lot of like, what I love about Miami is still here. I think what's missing or like what I'm feeling is that I know like within the next five to 10 years, if we're continuing at this rate, it won't be here mm. anymore. And I think that's the reality that we're currently living that like, yes, we see it still here, but in the future, will it still be here? And like, yeah. do I have to begin thinking about even like leaving the city that I call home, right? Because I know like within the next five years, things may continue to go downhill. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's my reflection on that. <laughs> if you were to leave Miami, what would you miss the most? Oh man, this is making me sad. Not the traffic. Not the traffic. Oh no, not the traffic. Um, I think I would. I would just miss miss a lot of like the cultures. Uh, like, you know, you could go get like Haitian food at every corner. You could get Colombian food, food at any yeah. corner. You could get like, uh, you know, Cuban, Puerto Rican, like so much I feel is, like there's so much culture um, in Miami that I think folks don't realize because we're in Miami that in other states it's mm -hmm. not like this. So like even traveling up, um, I, I, like when I was in Tallahassee, I completely missed Miami local culture. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. hoping this is gonna be a question that we can I want you to end in a positive place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, You are organizing, you are working for the things, you're asking difficult <laughs> questions, you're looking to make students feel safe to engage in these really difficult, difficult, impossible issues which we're seeing play out across the country in a very real, visceral way. So you wouldn't be doing this work if you didn't feel like there was some success possible. What do you want Miami to look like in 20 years? Mm. Let's, let's, let's That's imagine beautiful. we win. <laughs> like, what would it look like in 20 years? Hmm. Ooh, this is, this is a difficult question because you kind of have to like think forward. But I think it, it's, it's what we think about when we think about like our broader movement, right? Like what are we fighting for? And I think what I'm fighting for is a world where like my future children, my future generations can coexist and just can exist and thrive. Um, I think there's definitely a lot of communities in Miami right now who are just surviving. And I really wanna see what Miami can look like if all of our communities were thriving, mm -hmm. if Haitian folks were thriving, if, if, if um, Cuban folks, if Venezuelan folks, Central Americans were just thriving in this country, right? And weren't just surviving um, mm -hmm. would be um, what I'm fighting for and what I want Miami 
um, to look like. And I'm always somebody that definitely loves culture. Mm -hmm. And I think about like the preservation of culture and what that can look like. And I really want within the next 20 years, um, I guess for us to be inventive and to think about ways that we can preserve that culture mm -hmm. and ensure mm -hmm. we're respecting um, what folks have added to the Miami mm -hmm. space um, in a way right. that kind of like continues right throughout the next few years. And so that's what I would want Miami to look like. Like just recognizing the cultures and communities that shaped mm -hmm. the city, as well as ensuring that folks who were a part of those communities who are still there are thriving and existing. Um, mm -hmm. is, is what I would want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, if Miami was a song, this is the first time I'm asking this question. <laughs> this is extra credit, and then I want to talk okay. about what, what immediate call to action for your organization. If Miami <laughs> was, was a song, what would it be? I, I, I don't know why I keep on thinking about, like, um, well, one, Suavemente is coming to my head. Uh, the what? <laughs> Suavemente. Suavemente. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suavemente, because um, I think that kind of like just brings everybody together, man. Like, mm -hmm. Haitian folks fair, love fair. it. Like, other communities love it. Like, we all love it. I know all the words. And then more personally, like, when I think about Haitian music, like, and I know, like, other cultures, name it too, Zoukla, Sisel, Mezika, Manuni, like, which gets the party jumping. <laughs> um, so those, those, definitely those two cultural songs, I think, yeah. to find Miami. For me, La Gozadera. Okay. Uh, like that's the first thing yeah, that yeah, 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 I mean yeah. it has the word Miami in it but like just like they mention all the ethnicities uh -huh. all the different things all the like beauty and culture that I feel like is encompassed in Miami and it's just like a like I don't know it, it's Miami makes me happy makes my heart happy so like that song does too. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So we're wrapping up. Um, mm -hmm. We're definitely pushing time. Yes. Um, but I hope everyone will join us. We'll have more um, information on our on our Instagram about our next upcoming seasons. And I hope you'll follow, continue to follow us. Thank you for joining us for our last show. Before we leave, what should people know about Florida Student Power Network? The next the next thing that they can do, the next program that they can become involved in. Right. So if there are any <laughs> young people um, who are watching this right now and who definitely want to join our organizing community and join our student organizers. We do have a Power University program, which is um, an eight-week intensive immersive organizing program for beginner youth organizers um, that we opened up applications for. You can follow us at Florida Student Power um, to see that application, and you can just apply to participate. Um, we're going to have a statewide convening the first week to bring all of our folks um, together to kind of go through that um, organizing um, training and workshops that we have developed for young people, but that's definitely one way for folks to tap in and begin the organizing work that we have for us. And mm -hmm. something that is a little bit more immediate, I think I talked about the temporary protected status work and campaigns mm -hmm. that we're doing at our organization. This Thursday from um, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., we're going to be um, doing a flood the lines for TPS for Haitians and Nicaraguans, because when we talk about undocumented um, Central Americans, when we talk about uh, undocumented young people, like that is a solution that we, def we definitely push to get folks documented right and to ensure that folks have status right within a specific amount of time. So joining us um, this Thursday, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., which is also on our social media, to kind of support in that work and learn a little bit more about um, TPS as well and our other pathway to citizenship um, campaigns that we have within our org. Mm -hmm. and, and then more specific to Miami, there is going to be a training in late June um, that is we're co-hosting with um, Engage Miami and PRISM uh, that is very much a political education school as well. We're trying to create together a pipeline for um, youth to be able to get empowered and plugged into the movement. So um, there's going to be a Miami training and I can, I can definitely give the information so to we'll folks share that um thank you both for being here it was lovely to speak with you and, and learn more about the work that you're doing thank you thank, thank you, you so, much. so much for having us and thank you for all the work you do <laughs>